Hello. Hey, hi, Can you all hear you? me? I'm fine. All right, I think we should start with the debate. Let me start with the session. Let me invite. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's uh, third debate, which is the third debate in debate development series. Uh, this year's edition, which is the 17th edition of the debate and development series, has been organized online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in this edition, we are reflecting on decolonial perspectives. The first debate on the 13th of October on post-development and decolonial perspectives, Professor Ashilam Bembe and Ms. Els Hertogen kickstarted us with a discussion of some key issues on what decolonization means for the development sector. Reflections were made on the potential role of development NGOs for advocating for systemic change. Whereas in the second debate, which was last week on 20th October, was on decolonizing ecological, ecological relations. And in that debate, Dr. Diana Vela Almeida and Mr. Da Daniel Ribeiro discussed how decolonization can inform us while making sense of global environmental oppressives and responses to them. The attendance on both of these debates was remarkable. And for those who were unable to attend, you can find a link to the recordings on the website. Today, we will delve into uh, epistemic perspectives and the role of development studies in uh, the development project. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, my name is uh, Mark Marvin Kadigo. I am a PhD student and academic assistant at the Institute of Development Policy, at the University of Antwerp, Belgium. And it is a great honor for me to serve as the moderator for today's debate. Before we get into the debate, and before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to further contextualize this debate in development series and highlight the topic of today's discussion and also give you a brief structure of the debate. Uh, debate in development is an annual event which provides a platform for reflection on several topics of development. Uh, it is both an interfaculty course followed by students at the university and a public event accessible by a broader set of interested parties like you. It is organized at the University of Antwerp as a collaboration between the Institute of Development Policy and the University Foundation for Development Cooperation, which is USOS. In today's discussion, we shall grapple with the idea of a decolonial turn for development studies. Uh, if you may, uh, development studies are a major vehicle for narratives on development. That is eventually implemented as the development project draws from the theories and concepts which are part and parcel of development studies. Uh, simultaneously, development studies are continually influenced by the output of the development project. Hence, a system is created where defined and materialized development narratives are sustained. <laughs> This means that development studies are pivotal to the practices of development. Now, if theories, concepts, and techniques currently in development discourses are Euro-American centric, then the development we see today is tightly laced with coloniality. Therefore, if we seek to foster global justice by fighting coloniality in all its facets, we need to direct our attention to the knowledge system that potentially sustains the imbalance we see today. The centrality, the centrality of development studies to the development project therefore demands that we turn the colonial lens towards development studies as we reflect on what we define as development today. Now, I would like to embrace this opportunity to introduce our speakers to you. The keynote speaker is Professor Sabelo J. Ndlovu He is chair in epistemologies of the Global South with emphasis on Africa the University of Beirut in Germany. He is a leading decolonial theorist with over 100 publications in the field of African history, African politics, African development, and decolonial theory. He is a prominent voice in debates and conversations on colonialism, coloniality, and decolonization. His latest major publications include Epistemic Freedom in Africa, 
provincialization and decolonization, which was published in 2018. Um, there is another one called Decolonization, Development and Knowledge in Africa, Turning Over a New Leaf, which was published in 2020. And a book titled Thinking and Unthinking Development, uh, Development Perspectives, Perspectives on Inequality and Poverty in South Africa and Zimbabwe, which was co-edited with uh, Busani Mpofu and published in 2019, among many others. Professor Johan Bastiansen is the discussant in this debate. He's the chair of the Institute of Development Policy, which is IOB, the University of Antwerp. He is also the coordinator of the academic partnership with Research and Development Institute, NITLAPAN, of the Universidad Centroamericana in Managua, Nicaragua, since 1988. Because his main interest, main research interest lies with the transformative role of microfinance, for a more socially inclusive and sustainable rural development, he has continued to contribute to the broader theoretical and thematic development policy debate. He has also contributed to development of the Fondo de, de Sarolo Local, FDL, currently the largest and most true agricultural microfinance institution in Nicaragua. As chair, he is supporting the IOB team in their strategy for globalization and decolonization of the institute's master programs, research, and outreach activities. This is because he believes in deep, long, and functional north-south, or if you may, south-north academic relations. For the structure of today's debate, uh, first, uh, Professor Andlovo Gacheni will give a keynote of about 30 minutes. Then uh, Professor Bastiansen will immediately follow with a reflection of about 20 minutes. I will communicate when there is about five minutes left on the clock for each of them. Uh, thereafter, we will have a Q&A period. But first, we shall, during this period, we shall have the first set of questions coming in from the students uh, who follow this as a course. They were given texts prior to the debate, and they read them. They came up with a number of questions. And then in the last 30 to 40 minutes, you also, as a general audience, will have an opportunity to ask your questions. However, in the meantime, I would request that you jot down your questions, which you will be able to upload later on an online platform, which is Poll Everywhere. And the link to this platform will be provided to you at a later time. And on that platform, you'll also be able to vote on the questions uh, based on relevance, to vote on the questions which should appear at the top based on their relevance. Uh, finally, uh, and before I forget, you can also tweet about this debate using the hashtag Deb Dev. That is hashtag D E B D E V. Um, to kick start this debate, uh, I would like to invite our keynote, Professor Andlovu Gacheni, to the floor. Professor Andlovu, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I must actually thank you for, for the invitation. And thank you, the IOP, for inviting me. And Mark, you were, you were tireless whenever I was not replying to the emails. Uh, and uh, that made me really to, to not forget the event. Um, the debate on, um, on uh, a decolonial turn in development studies my my first set of comments will be about uh, knowledge and reality and uh, then i will follow those set of comments with a uh, a related one on uh, the embeddedness of development in the cognitive empire and if you take the two you can see that i'm trying to think through the whole issue of development from an epistemic perspective. And then thirdly, I will also uh, share briefly some views on the attempts which have been made to decolonize development in Africa, in general in the Global South. <clears throat> and I move on to why those initiatives did not succeed, and then turn directly to the question of the decolonial turn for development studies. 
<clears throat> and then end with the the most difficult part, which is about mapping the possible future of development uh, studies. And I will try to introduce, to think through that, through what I've turned to the 10 days of the decolonial turn. So those, that's, that's, the, that's the mind map of what I'm going to share today. Uh, and I will move a bit slowly at the beginning and then pick the speed as I move. Uh, <clears throat> my entry point is a very simple entry point whereby I'm positing that uh, what about if we think about knowledge as a creator of reality? And uh, in that way, we begin to think about the idea of development, the discourse of development, also as an epistemic creation. And that epistemic creation is actually uh, coexisting with a world system, which is itself also framed by knowledge. And that argument, again, is not really my argument per se. It's an argument which have been introduced and in by people like Walter Mignolo and uh, Catherine Walsh. And uh, it actually acknowledged that knowledge is weaved around the concepts such as politics, such as economy, uh, such as society. And uh, to, to simplify, to further simplify this issue of the relationship between epistemology and knowledge, as an entry point into discussions on development, uh, Mignolo and Walsh, they actually used the simple example of a puppeteer and a puppet to, to understand the, develop, the, the relationship between ontology and epistemology. And they argued that the puppeteer might not be, might be unseen, but is the one who actually directs the things which you see on the surface. So knowledge actually, uh, acts that way. Um, and there is not only uh, Mignolo and the Walsh who speak up this way about the issue of how ontology is made of epistemology. Even Paul Ventura de Santos, drawing on the work of Pierre Bourdieu, also argued that social scientific knowledge invented much of what it describes as existing. But the major problem and the, the importance of this entry point is that we need to understand that what knowledge establishes and naturalizes and normalizes, it actually then begins to then block the emergence of another knowledge. So the issue then is why is this relevant to our debate today? I think it is relevant at a number of levels. The first level is that um, perhaps what we see as development challenges, what we see as development impulse, what we see as a development crisis might actually be emanating from an epistemic crisis. And it is because the epistemic crisis does, normally, does not normally announce itself as an epistemic crisis. It actually manifests in in institutions, in structures, and in ideologies while hiding behind. And this entry point becomes very important, particularly during this conjecture in which we are meeting, where we are meeting within a context of uncertainties of knowledges. The key issue perhaps is where and how does development sit in the world of knowledge, which is uncertain, and the knowledge which is expressing itself, which is expressing some signs of being uh, exhausted. And that knowledge which I'm talking about, again, I'm not the one who talks about it as very uncertain and exhausted. If you read the works of uh, Emmanuel Wallace, and particularly his book on uncertainties of knowledge, he speaks very eloquently about us living in a systemic crisis that is forcing us to reopen the basic epistemological questions 
and to look to structural reorganization of the world of knowledge. And the, the people like um, scholars like Bonaventura Tisus Santos, they then argue that there are very clear signs that our knowledge today is exhausted, particularly when it is failing to produce new critical norms. And such an exhausted knowledge then uh, propels itself forward through adding adjectives to well-known nouns. And uh, those who are working within development studies, they can easily tell where I'm going. Uh, because development studies is one of the main calibrates which actually uses noun to justify its existence when it is exhausted or when it is not being realizable. You can think about development studies with uh, so many nouns it has produced under, under development, alternative development, integral development, inclusive development, sustainable development. You can go on and on. And uh, we might actually be uh, poised for another adjective added to that, perhaps post-COVID-19 development. Uh, the interesting part about this issue of uh, the failure to generate new nouns is that we then find that uh, in mainstream thinking, if it is not about adding adjectives, we then uh, practice development. The development thinking is then driven through reports through commissions, through summits, and uh, through plans, which are generally organized and, uh, and articulated by the, such agencies as the World Bank, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, what the Nigerian economies have development merchant system. And I don't need to, to lecture you on that. You know the, the, the main debates, the will branded report right up to the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, these are generally very prescriptive. And uh, when they, what they prescribe fail, they either blame those to whom these prescriptions were imposed, or they simply produce another report with the new prescriptions. And uh, these were my first set of reflections as I want to think through the whole question of development from an epistemic perspective. But I think the other concept which I will need to introduce again in a very simplified version is the concept of a cognitive empire, uh, which actually frames development. And that cognitive empire becomes very important because one of the main uh, very simple and straightforward arguments which I want to, to put forward is that all the problems which were facing today uh, in development, in politics, and everywhere. I don't think it can be understood without us understanding the empire. And I, and I, and I think I will try to, 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 to prove that the predicament, particularly of Africa and the global south, which we are facing today, is not a matter of personal choice, but arises from a historical situation, a historical situation which is framed by the empire. And uh, I'm talking here about the cognitive empire specifically because one of the most understood empires, uh, the most understood empire is the physical empire and uh, perhaps also the commercial non-territorial empire. But what we've not spoken about often is the cognitive empire. And I think when we want to understand the uh, the, the decolonial turn in development studies, uh, we need really to understand how that cognitive empire operates because it is one which invades the mental universe of the people uh, so that it actually determines the thinking. And it is the cognitive empire which is very operative and active today. Uh, uh, speaking historically, you will think about such initiatives as Frank Afrique and uh, the problem of uh, uh, financial imperialism, particularly in French West Africa. You can think of Euro-Africa 
the law conventions, you can think of the Commonwealth as all products of, of people sitting down and thinking about how to maintain dominance, how to maintain hegemony over, 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 over Africa and the other parts of the world. And some of the scholars have written about this cognitive empire as the metaphysical empire. Some will call it empires of the mind. And those empires are very important for us to understand because they mutate over time and they use different strategies to maintain the asymmetrical frames of, uh, of power between the global north and the global south. And today we can actually speak in words of uh, Robert Kildia of a global financial empire which maintains the, the asymmetrical power relations through the, 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 the debt slavery. Uh, and that debt actually enabling those who are developed to actually impose <clears throat> their controls as well as their demands on the global south. And I'm, I'm talking about all this because I want us to, to have both a, perhaps a philosophical, but at the same time, a historical uh, understanding of where this question of development sits in our lives and in the lives of the nations in which we inhabit. And uh, having done that, I was actually trying also to say, in order, before you talk about a decolonial turn, you must first of all understand the colonial turn. And when I was speaking about the issue of the cognitive empire, I was trying actually to introduce this idea that there is a colonial turn which actually invaded the mental universe uh, of, of the people and they imposed the particular ways of knowing, particular ways of understanding, and the particular ways of understanding what is development. And if we want to understand that colonial turn, we must also understand where uh, the notion of development sit in a linear conception of the world, the normative, the post-enlightenment normative uh, orders of salvation, uh, civilization, press, social evolution, uh, emancipation, modernization. It, it sits there, and the and the and the and the, the idea is that. If, it's, it's a linear process which can be achievable if you follow particular steps. Uh, and having given that background, I want now to turn to what I think is relevant to our discussion today, which is about decolonization and the development. And I want to speak about, uh, in, I spoke about the three empires, the physical, the, the commercial, non-territorial, and I spoke up also about the cognitive. I think when, when, when we then speak about decolonization, we can also see that it almost it takes three inexorably intertwined trajectories. Uh, uh, the political decolonization, uh, economic decolonization, and what is upon us today, which made me to actually enter from an epistemological point of view, is the epistemic decolonization. Uh, and the but historically, you can then say when did, when can, where can we locate the beginning of uh, the decolonial turn? Uh, some will argue that at the very time of the of the enactment of the colonial turn, the decolonial turn also began. But I want to think here more as a historian and say, perhaps you can trace the decolonial turn to the Bandung Conference of 1955. Why am I tracing it from that? It was from that conference that colonialism was redefined, not just as a, a political uh, and a direct system which administers uh, societies. At the opening of that conference, President Sukarno of India, I'm sorry, of Indonesia, uh, put it very clearly. He said, I beg you, do not think of colonialism only in a classical form, which, which we of India and our brothers in different parts of Asia and Africa 
new colonialism has this modern dress in the form of economic control, intellectual control, actually physical control by a small but alien community within the nations. It is a skillful and a determined enemy, and it appears in many cases. It does not give up its loot. And interestingly, again at the Bandung conference, it was at Bandung conference that there was a clear statement that Asia and Africa do not want to be copycats of Europeans, Americans, or Russians. They wanted to chart their own uh, trajectory of politics and their own trajectory of development. And that trajectory of development, they actually spoke about it in terms of self-reliance. It must be predicated on self-reliance. And in that way, I think we can actually underscore the idea that it might be one might be one event where we can trace the decolonial turn, but some can even go back, and I will I will reflect on that uh, uh, later. Uh, and from that time, you can see practical steps being taken uh, by the global south in its attempt to implement self-reliance and also to disengage from uh, the global north determining uh, its, uh, its destiny. You can see uh, the formations of such, uh, such, such, such movements as the non-aligned movement. You can see uh, <clears throat> the global south pushing for what is known as the, the new international economic order. Uh, where they were trying to de hierarchize the racially hierarchized world system and the prevent, which prevented other parts of the world from developing. But when I opened up, I said uh, the, one of the major problems is that whenever we are thinking about development, uh, we are always thinking in terms of either summits, uh, either plans, or charters, you will find that. Development, particularly in Africa, also produced an array of declarations, charters, plans, strategies, and frameworks. Uh, as though the problem was lack of frameworks themselves, rather than the structural global power structure. I don't want to go through all of them, but I will give you some examples. In 1973, uh, you will see Afri Africans coming up with the African Declaration on cooperation, development, and economic independence, which articulated African strategies for gradual disengagement from the world economy through prioritization of national and continental self-reliance in the spirit of, of the Bandung Conference. And I must hasten to say, when we're thinking about the Bandung uh, Conference, we can also speak about the Bandung version of development. And that Bandung version of development, as Tandika Mukanda will put it, stand in contradistinction from the Truman version of development after 1945. <clears throat> and now turning to the to the decolonial turn itself. What is it? What is it that we're talking about when we're talking about the decolonial turn? I think I've already said that it is very hard to be precise about when it starts. But I think the decolonial turn is an encapsulation of a, of a rising consciousness uh, as well as a long-standing uh, demand to shift from a colonizer's model of the world and the colonial turn. And you, because of that, you will find people like like Nelson Madonado Torres positing that decolonial thinking has existed since the very inception of modern forms of colonialism, and they trace it as far back as the 15th century. And what makes it not hard to be, to be precisely defined is that it does not refer to a singular theoretical school. It points to a number of diverse positions diverse ideologies which actually challenge uh, colonial colonialism. And if we think that way, 
some people will argue that perhaps you can go as far back as Marcus Garvey's Negro self-improvement initiatives if you want to trace some of the turning points. Uh, I've already spoken about the Bandung Conference as another turning point, but another turning point which might be important for us dealing with the question of development might be the South Commission of 1987 to 1990, which was led by Julius Nyerere, where again, the spirit of Bandung seemed to have infused itself into the thinking there because the emphasis was again on self-reliance and charting an autonomous development path. Uh, but one of the other issues which we cannot ignore when we think about the decolonial turn for development is that this, this development, this, this turn is always a site of struggle itself. It's not a straightforward turn. It's a site of struggle uh, which brings intellectual, ideological, and the practical activist uh, activities together. Uh, <clears throat> others can actually speak about how do you speak about the decolonial turn and how different is it from a post-development turn for that matter. And I think we'll need Pepsi to, to reflect on that in the discussions. But what is precise about the decolonial turn for development studies we are very clear that it is not about pushing for the completion of modernity. It is not about that. It is actually about the unfinished project of decolonization. Uh, perhaps it is also important to highlight that as a trajectory and a project and a horizon of liberation, a decolonial turn has always been characterized by <clears throat> a Ambiguities and ambiguities which emanate from the immanent logic of coloniality, which continues to resist, destabilize, and discipline colonial, uh, decolonial initiatives. But now we need also to try to be specific, particularly for development studies. What does the decolonial turn uh, entail for development studies as a field? I think the first thing which we need to it actually demands that development studies be liberated from the colonizing Euro-modernist narratives and the notions, even the norms of salvation, civilization, progress, social evolution, modernization, and emancipation. Because these renditions uh, tend to, to designate some lives, particular lives of black people, those people who have designated as black, brown and other questioned subjectivities into people who live outside modern time, people who are actually backward, primitive, and regressive compared to Europe. So there is that element of comparability between other, other, other ways of living and the ways of living in, in Europe, with the way of living in Europe being a template uh, for what others need to achieve. Then the second issue, which I think is important coming from the decolonial turn is that it demands the unmasking in the words of uh, Rob Tail Pile of the embedded gaze within development. That gaze of Africa in general and the, the global south in particular of being seen without of being seen without seeing those who see it. And in this in this embedded white case is the one which gave rise to such terminology as orientalism, uh, colonial difference, colonial library, and the others in development studies. And the, 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 the decolonial term demands that we need to be aware of that, that, that embedded white case in development. And it is a very resilient case because even out, out all, after all these initiatives, it continues up to today. Then the third is that the decolonial turn in development studies is also invites us to deal with the problematic issue of binaries and dichotomies of understanding human life. The dichotomies of developed, underdeveloped, informal, formal, north, south, which are actually expressions of a power dynamics and the power differentials 
And I think fourthly, what the decolonial training development studies brings to the fore is the need for a new lexicon. There is a, there is a combining with even the post development, there is a, a feeling that the word de development itself is dirty. It actually carries the poison of race and the poison of imperialism. So we need to think of a lexicon which might actually be better than the idea of development. And so far, I must hasten to say we have failed to actually replace the term with something uh, more usable. Uh, then the fifth uh, issue which I think arises from a decolonial turn for development is this issue of uh, shifting the geography and the biography of knowledge, uh, moving the center uh, so that in development studies, we take seriously epistemologies of the global south. We take seriously theory from the south or southern theory and the endogenous uh, knowledges. And I must, I must attach to those set of comments also, why is it that the initiatives which I spoke about never materialized? And again, I will I will try to to give a critique which is which is linked to epistemic issues. And again, I will draw from uh, scholars like Semia Amin. It was Semia Amin uh, in his evaluation of the Lagos Plan of Action of 1980, who argued that the failure of that plan was not that it was not funded, but the the failure was linked to the epistemic foundations of the economists and all those who met because they never delinked from Eurocentric classical economic thought, which was always irrelevant to some of the problems which the Africa and Global South were dealing with. And it was also uh, Semia Amin who also critiqued even the Bandung version of development. That uh, the Bandung version of development is actually dominated by the thinking of nationalist bourgeois politicians from Africa and Asia who believed in technical models of development. <clears throat> and he went on even to critique the new the demand for a new international order, that it was reformist rather than revolutionary. There was still belief in that global imperial power can concede to change without revolutionary assault. And the, I think the fourth limit uh, is the limit of the agents of decolonization themselves, whether in Africa, Asia, Latin America, or the Caribbean. If the agents were indeed the petty bourgeois, the nationalist elites, I think we need also to then bring in Fanon here about uh, the pitfalls of consciousness of those forces for change. And then the other critique is that all the, de the development initiatives which were taken, they were never anchored on the cultural uh, uh, ground of the global south. And uh, that culture being the soil in which development can grow. And uh, today, we then speak about development being dead within the global matrices of power, which manage and uh, sustain the asymmetrical power relations. And as I conclude, uh, I want us to then say, what exactly is the way forward as we think about this uh, decolonial turn in development studies? And I want us to, I want to posit, drawing from my book, Epistemic Freedom, that is it possible that we can think, rethink development without epistemic freedom itself? And I want to argue that at the center of that epistemic freedom is something which our render as rethinking thinking itself. The major problem with the development studies is the recycling of old ideas. 
And I think what is needed for us is to unlearn some of those ideas which actually sustain imperialism, colonialism, and the coloniality, so that we are able to develop new concepts, new lexicon, as I said. And again, I can refer to the work of Gilbert Rist in that book, The History of Development from Western Origins to Global Faith, where he argued that the aim then is to change our perception, to see the world differently, to get the measure of the dead ends into which we have strayed, to stop believing in the promises of a better future from the very people who mortgage it so heavily, to change our model of society. The most difficult task, however, is to ensure that knowledge triumphs over faith and to persuade ourselves that there is a life after development. But we need also to then put content into what we mean by rethinking thinking. And I think the work of Katharina, Catherine Odora Hoppers and the Richard Howard is very useful, particularly in their thin book entitled Rethinking Thinking, whereby they said when we're talking about rethinking thinking, we're talking about, about a very practical process of bringing in those knowledges which have been pushed out of mainstream thinking those knowledges of the people who have been said to have no knowledge, and the work to bring categories of self-definition, of dreaming, of acting, of loving, of living into the common as a matter of universal concern. And I want to end then by talking about taking Gilbert Ristis is challenge that it looks like the strength of development discourse from its power to seduce in the in every sense of the word to charm to please to, fasc to fascinate to search dreaming but also to abuse to turn away from truth to deceive and if this is true how do we think about the future of development studies and what is the contribution of a decolonial term in development studies? I think what is emerging is what I've, I've, some of the issues I've already referred to. It seems like we need to think very deeply about how to decolonize the very term development. This means delinking it from Eurocentric normative notions. But is this possible without investing in changing the modern world system and its colonial orders. I want to argue that perhaps we have a golden opportunity now because of the current COVID-19 pandemic, which has deepened the skepticism about Europe and North America as templates of progress and development, and it has exposed their complicity in generating modern problems with, while they fail to come up with modern solutions. And I think we have a, a, a window of rethinking things there. But I want to end by reflect, reflecting on the future, the future of development studies. And um, I was thinking that if we are indeed serious about the decolonial turn, we need to give content to its coordinates. And I decided that perhaps I think about 10 of them. The first one, de-imperialization, and that is supposed to actually alert us to the urgency of structural transformation of the colonizers' model of the world. And then the second one is de bourgeoisment shifting from the bourgeois way of life as a template of good life and de-linking from bourgeois knowledge, because that is the knowledge of a minority of men. And then depatriarchization, which means in development studies, we take seriously feminist thought as a way forward, or what Oriyonke Oyewumi termed the maternal ideology, which is life-giving, life-sustaining and preserving, enabling and ennobling, and is opposed to sexism and gender discrimination. And we think also about what we talk about almost every day, the problem of capitalist fundamentalism. And we think of decorporatization, 
delinking from our lives being determined in tone to by coloniality of markets. And because I was underscoring the issue of knowledge, perhaps one of the major issues which we need to deal with in development studies, the issue of decanonization. You decanonize these knowledges which actually plunge us into the current crisis so that we open up to other knowledges. And the opening up, I must be very clear here, I'm not then saying throw away everything which comes from Europe but what I'm arguing for is what Bonaventura de Santos terms ecologies of knowledges, bringing other knowledges uh, into the academy and into the thinking. And the, this is linked also to the, to the other part, which is deparochization of theory, whereby you need also to open up to theories from other parts of the world. And the desecularization, the opening up to the diverse spiritualities as embodiments of knowledge. I don't want to talk about deracialization. I think everyone knows that we are still suffering because of this color line, which actually emerged from modernity. And the de-universalization, so that we have recognized diverse ways of thinking. And then democratization, which again, I don't think I need to, to, to define that one. But I'm giving all these as coordinates and indeed content of planetary decolonization of the 21st century. And I'm trying to delineate what has to be changed for another world to emerge. They might sound like utopic registers, but I think utopic registers are very useful. And I want to end by agreeing with Achil Mbembe that a proper definition of development has to do with saving lives here on earth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ndlovukatsheni. Now I think we should immediately hear from Professor Johan Bastiansen. Professor. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, nice to see you and or not see you, but nice uh, for you all to be here and wanting to listen to me. Um, First of all, I, I would like to thank the organizers of this series of debating development webinars about decolonization, because I think no doubt that it is a very urgent and very relevant topic for today. I think this is all the more so since we live in extremely challenging times, whereas Ashil Mbembe indeed uh, reminded us in the first session, life itself and the survival of humanity is at stake. And we do not have the luxury to think as usual in line with old certainties and old ideas, and in particular also not old ideas and certainties about development, so-called development, both for the allegedly less developed regions and even less for the allegedly more developed countries of the world. Uh, it seems clear to me, and I agree with the previous speaker here, that we are facing a systemic crisis of our civilization, uh, of our ways of relating to each other, to ourselves and to other uh, non-human living beings and other in our life supporting ecosystems. So I believe and I agree that it is extremely relevant for the debate today to keep this context of a deep crisis of the old model of development, of whatever it means, into account when discussing the topic of decolonization of development studies, which I think needs to be approached from this urgent need to reinvent and save us all from development, uh, development between uh, question marks. Uh, and I'm convinced that this reinvention of development can only emerge out of a truly collective global effort to rethink and reorganize precisely all these things our relations to each other, our relations to ourselves, and our relations to nature. To me, it is, it is like the only alternative for this truly global collective factors, uh, uh, sorry, for this truly global collective effort, is like a dangerous and ultimately violent retreat in false ethno-nationalist solutions. So in that sense, I think decolonizing our thoughts and bringing down and opening up the cognitive empire, of which uh, 
Professor Nlovu uh, Gacieni was talking, is actually or might actually be an important precondition for such an urgently necessarily global endeavor. Um, so I read in Savello's article that some African scholars have argued, and I, I didn't know that, but I found it very interesting, have argued that in nations with a history of settler colonialism, a thorough reset between settlers and original inhabitants is needed as a precondition to start nation building. It seems like a very, very important and true idea to me. And I strongly believe that a similar reset might actually be needed in order to allow for the creation of the global political space, precise and correct global political space, that we need to find our way to alternative viable pathways of so-called development. Now, before continuing, I would like to say that I'm not at all a specialized scholar in the decolonization debate. Uh, nor actually in the diagnosis of the vast field of development studies and its evolution as such. Um, so therefore, I would actually follow another lead, which I found in the article that was given, in the article uh, mm -hmm. of Professor Novo Gacheni that was sent to us, where he said that the logic of enunciation is a route to decolonization and epistemic justice. So a logic where we explicitly position ourselves uh, in time and place from which we speak and from which our knowledge emerges. So it is this logic that I want to follow now uh, and that will guide my reaction to the keynote. Uh, so a reaction that then follows my specific positioning. Uh, um, of course, this positioning has different dimensions and we might talk hours about what exactly it all entails. Just a few key points here. Yeah. Of course, I'm an older European, Belgian, Flemish, Antwerp-based white development scholar, and development studies scholar, initially trained as an economist, but already as a student member of a student organization called the Concerned Economists, uh, uh, critical perspectives. And then as a scholar, I I enter, I, I've I entered and I have always almost all my of my career been working on issues of peasants and peasant development in Nicaragua. And I try to do so in a systematic cooperation with academics and practitioners from a local university institute, which was operating at the crossroads of academic research and practice, including the creation of a microfinance institution, as Mark has already said. Uh, today, I am also occupying the rotating position of the chair of the IOB. I said, this is a function which has actually obliged me to step out of my specific comfort zone of Nicaragua and presence in Nicaragua and to think and act beyond my own niche of activities. Mm -hmm. so from all these things, I will try to give a few additional comments on perspectives for development studies. I need to indicate, however, before my colleagues get too afraid that I'm not speaking, I mean, I'm speaking out of my positioning as a chair, but I'm not speaking uh, as the chair. Uh, and so I'm not speaking in the name of the Institute, but in my own personal name, and not all of my colleagues might uh, necessarily agree with everything that I'm saying. But I wanted not to, uh, I would say, I, I, would, I, I wanted to be able to, to speak with a little bit more freedom and not to have to represent the political uh, consensus of the Institute. Now, first about the relation between development studies and the cognitive empire and the imperial colonial project. I think, first of all, yes, historically and until today, I think there are clearly stands of trends of development studies, maybe more important, Parts in all of our inherited thinking as development scholars, whose underlying framings and whose practices of research, teaching, and outreach can indeed be considered consciously or unconsciously as part of the imperial colonial epistemology, maybe also imperial colonial practices. And to the extent that this is still the case, uh, uh, of course, and, and this is particularly the case to the extent that we still depart or de 
defend even the superiority of the Western route road and its way of organizing human relations and human nature relations. And it is, in my view, it's undeniable that this indeed entails the risk of epistemic violence that the previous speaker was denouncing. And it is clear, it, there is a clear and urgent need, I think, to further review uh, our practices and our thinking in this way, both as a development studies institute and as a university in general, I think. And so I'm very happy that our institute in the recent new policy plan has indeed adopted this as a, uh, uh, an activity to continue working on. Now, as academic scholars, both in the so-called Global North and the so-called Global South, we of course need to be aware of the contestable non-scientific dimensions of our always biased and always limited scientific knowledge. And thus also of the potentially problematic knowledge frames and the related practices that we apply. But I think we must also acknowledge a certain inevitability that philosophical and non uh, an in inevitability of that philosophical and non scientific dimension of our knowledge and of any thinking. Any knowledge and any, any scientific knowledge will inevitably be biased, which means, and I think I'm fully in line with uh, the previous speaker here, that decolonizing the university or decolonizing development studies clearly does not imply the adoption one true frame of knowledge, of one true way of doing things. Uh, it is not about the replacement of a Western canon by another canon or other canons. It is about getting rid of the canons. Uh, so uh, what it does imply, therefore, for me, is the need to develop a more relational and cooperative view of knowledge creation and actually of knowledge co-creation among scholars with different positionalities different cultural, philosophical, disciplinary, and methodological approaches, and also trying to involve non-academic stakeholders in a truly transdisciplinary perspective. Uh, I think that, first of all, this is not an evident task because, because our tradition is not exactly in this way. And also, I think that, uh, we need to be aware, especially of, as Northern scholars, uh, I think we need to be aware and conscious of the historical and current injustices and inequalities and try to give an adequate response to that, which is not always an easy task, I think. Um, in this context, I think, and I particularly believe that the creation and the, uh, the creation of mutually beneficial, I'm sorry, of mutually beneficial and enriching long-term partnerships Southern academics and institute, institutes are a key part of the development of such a relational view of knowledge co-production in uh, development studies. And this option has been a tradition at IOB, initially maybe not that uh, mainstream, but gradually more and more prominent. And some partnerships actually date back more than three decades. I think with these partnerships, we try to build them on solidarity, on shared values and agendas, and on systematically trying to avoid the toxic but all too popular word of capacity building. But I'm also aware that here intentions do not automatically translate into reality. Um, our experience, or at least my experience, learned me that it is actually very difficult, possibly even impossible, to engage in truly equal partnerships as long as the prevailing context of inequality and unequal access to resources is not changed. It remains very difficult to have equal partnerships if one side of the equation has budgets, tenure with good salary and job security, relatively predictable institutional frameworks, while the, while the other part of the equation does not have all of this. Uh, all too often, we also find that we still tend to dominate agenda setting. We hardly find any scholar from the South doing research on our own societies. It's even, it even costs us to imagine the idea that that would be useful and possible. Uh, that's also, of course, because we still have a better access to money, even if we very often need our partners to acquire the funding. 
it's clearly also a very challenging question to answer up to where our solidarity with our academic partners actually goes. Clearly, it is all too simple, but also all too common to say that it ends when our external funding dries up. So I think that here, in this main topic and important topic of partnerships, we still have a very concrete agenda to decolonize our practice. Uh, and at IOB, we, we are uh, interested to continue working with our partners in order to try maybe to formulate a new code of conduct for equal and just partner relationships in academics in, at the service of the people we want to support. And I'm eager to hear whether uh, Professor Novu uh, Gacheni will have suggestions in that field. Now, it also must clear, of course, that cooperate. It must be clear also that cooperation with southern academics definitely is necessary to diversify and open up the positionalities from which we generate our knowledge. It is definitely necessary, but we should not fall in the trap to assume and to think that all southern scholars, by definition, represent a decolonial perspectives, nor, for that matter in the reverse, that all northern, northern scholars are necessarily suspicious of being caught up in imperial colonial frames. This brings me to a final very important point about development studies. In a development study uh, institute like the IOB, as I understand it at this moment, I think it's very important to stress that development studies is a house with many rooms. There are a large diversity of topics, disciplinary perspectives, philosophical positions and values, methodological policy and political perspectives. And I think we can safely say that the, decolonizing, that the decolonization debate itself is part of that house. And I also would submit the proposition that not all of these rooms are equally at risk of being supportive of the imperial colonial project. If I look, for example, at my own trajectory in development studies, you already know that I started as an economist student, but in my first seminar on development cooperation, as it was still called, of course, in that time, in the Faculty of Applied Economics, I started with a paper about Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed. And of course, Freire is a Brazilian and Southern scholar. Uh, and I think his thinking is decolonial in its core, in particular in his rejection of top-down banking education, of the transfer of knowledge from the knowable teacher to the ignorant, uh, uh, in, in, in ignorant analphabet, and coining and coming up with a relational pedagogical model, building upon the exchange of knowledges and contributing to the emancipation of both the educated and the educator. It still reads for me like a kind of uh, interesting entry point to start thinking about a decolonial, a decolonial turn in development studies. It's true, of course, that when I started to really study development in economics, I was guided towards the economic classics like Lewis, Rostov's growth models, and the equally massive economic neo-Marxist literature. But I, I was happy to escape to microeconomics. And through the debate on farm models, I make the connection to peasant and agrarian uh, system and, 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 and agrarian question literature. And rapidly it became clear to me that neoclassical economists economics was too limited to understand what was really happening from a bottom-up actor perspective. So I gradually started to introduce sociology, anthropology in my approaches. And I think this kind of trajectory and the increasing mobilization of multidisciplinary perspectives is very typical for development studies. I think this, especially in the tradition of actor-oriented, bottom-up interdisciplinary approaches, I think that these are less prone to the colonial fallacy. And not only because they are dedicated to understanding what concrete actors uh, of development actually do and want, but also because it builds mainly upon non-economic social sciences, which I think traditionally are much more aware 
and sensitive to the epistemological pitfalls of scientific analogies. And they have more awareness of the positionality of any scholar and her or his knowledge claims. Much more, for example, they are more positivistic strands of economic thought. So I think today in the development sector, in the development studies sector, and certainly at the IOB, we therefore cherish and cultivate vision of development studies, which built upon the recognition of variegated philosophical backgrounds, epistemological and methodological traditions, and complementary disciplinary and methodological approaches. We have adopted a mixed methods and a mixed perspective approach of research and, and teaching in our institute. We know that we do not necessarily agree on philosophical and political principles and starting. We know that we adopt and value different disciplinary perspectives and that the way and the ways in which they establish what is relevant, which is sorry, what is relevant and rigorous in science. We clearly do not agree on that. We do not, we, but we also agree that we do not have true answers not even maybe that we know what the true problems in development are. And most important, I think, uh, we agree that we disagree. We agree that this disagreement also reflects the broader disagreements in the debate about so-called development. And we agree that many of the disagreements are ultimately founded on political criteria. And the only way forward is a real and just political debate and the acceptance of the limitations of all perspectives. And this, this brought us to our principle of the fact that the wisdom is in the Baobab. Uh, uh, a saying coming from somewhere in Africa, I think Ghana, which actually states that it is in the bringing together of different perspectives, indeed in, in the Sousa Santos encounter of knowledges that a true wisdom is. And we believe this is an excellent framework for our education, since with disagreeing professors, students are obliged to position themselves and to think for themselves and it also fits i think the universal mission of the university to work for the commons of the world recognizing which i think requires the recognition of the pluriverse of knowledges we indeed need a pluriversity to become a university in that sense and i truly believe that this is uh, also a very interesting entry point uh, to make, not to make, to actually continue the ongoing process of the decolonial term in development studies. This is not a matter, I think, of some discrete change which we need to make now or somewhere uh, in the near future, but is something, I think, which is an ongoing struggle indeed, you said, uh, that if we, uh, the decolonization is a site of struggle, Indeed, I think it clearly is. I would add that it, I think it's even very important as part of decolonization to understand that this struggle needs to be a joint struggle. We need to be liberated on all sides from the imperial colonial project, not only the global south, which I do not deny evidently has suffered most from the imperial colonial project. So I will leave it here. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Johan Pastensen, for the uh, the discussion. So I think uh, at this point we are going to head into the Q and A session. Uh, Professor Ndlovugacheni, maybe uh, we can remind you to uh, turn on your mic just in case you are ready to answer some of the questions. And also, uh, I'm going to start with a set of questions that, are, as I mentioned, I'm going to start with a set of questions that uh, were uh, submitted by the students uh, who read some texts prior to, the, uh, prior to this uh, debate. And then later on, uh, we shall have questions from the general audience. And uh, uh, the link to the poll everywhere uh, website or platform will be shared in the in the chat where you can already start writing your uh, submitting your yeah it has already been shared you can already start submitting in your questions uh, as we start on the Q&A so I want to start with the first question 
and uh, uh, I'll read as it was written. Um, the colonial perspective requires that we view actors from the global south as authentic, rigorous, and robust producers of knowledge rather than just native informants. This is especially if the development being discussed is that of the South. This in turn orients the responsibility of the Southern of Southern development on the Southern actors. Moreover, a decolonial perspective is meant to change the terms of intellectual and academic conversation. Now, given that, what then can the Northern development scholars or actors do in the context of uh, colonial epistemology? Uh, if uh, uh, can they retain an active role in the production of knowledge on the southern development without risking interference, or should they rele be relegated to silently follow the south in this process? That's the question. Um, Mark, I think let's do this way. Maybe they give about three questions. Right. Okay, so that's the first question. If you're taking notes, then the next question would be, uh, in your article, you wrote about uh, you wrote some uh, very interesting statements, uh, and uh, question was posed from that. You say, if powerful people will will never educate powerless people on what it, it means to take power away from them, and if the aim of the powerful is to stay powerful by any means necessary, then what is left, or what is what is it to be said for institutions such as the IOB, which is a North-based institution teaching development studies to a wide audience, including actors from the global South. Uh, should what what should such institutions do if indeed they will be seen in the light of the powerful who are not willing to give knowledge on on what it means to take power from them? And should the scholars from the North withdraw from conversations on the global South on Southern development and leave it to thinkers from the global South? That's the second question. And then uh, the third question would be um, the third question would be that the articles that the, the students read demonstrate that there is an awareness of the importance of uh, decolonization of decolonizing development studies, but a difficulty in bringing it into practice. Moreover, de development and decolonization are interpreted differently by different actors. However, what is clear is that a decolonial perspective is meant to change the content of intellectual and academic conversations on development. Therefore, in the process of instituting decolonial epistemic perspectives in order to eliminate the coloniality of power, knowledge, and being in development studies, does this process entail invalidation of the previous knowledge on southern development, on southern development produced by researchers from the global north? That's the third question. Okay, okay. No, thank you so much for those those questions. They seem to be a common denominator across the three of them. The concern about the the contribution of the in quotation marks the scholars of the global north. Uh, I think uh, I, I think it cuts across the three questions. Uh, uh, the last one being that uh, should what do we do with the the knowledge produced previously by the uh, those uh, deemed to be the scholars from the global north? I think I think the first uh, response is that it's a very complicated categorization to say they are global north and the global south scholars. Uh, in the first place, we, we, we need to be careful when we use those words because uh, Jan and myself, I think we are product of the same universities. <laughs> so, uh, I can't say I went to a decolonial university or a decolonized university. I went really to a university. Of course, it was located in the global south, but what I learned there was not different from what was learned elsewhere because it was part of a, a world system modern system of universities so it's a that's that's one two most of the scholars who are now located in the 
global south, most of them are educated in the West. So it's it's a those binaries. I think we need not to take them to mean geography per se. Uh, I think they need they mean we need to emphasize more on epistemological standpoint uh, rather than really to say somebody is in the north at the moment. I mean the north, but um, from the <laughs> from the global south. So the is is not is not as easy as that that you can just say. This this one is from the global north. This one is there is a global north in the global south. There is a global south in the global north. So there is there is all that, and that's why we we tend to use this term like the the planetary human entanglement, uh, whereby these binaries they they are still uh, infused by power differentials. But the people have moved really in different directions, and uh, the issue is the consciousness of the people is what matters more than more than where they are located. We, we, this is why we had a problem with the earlier attempt to decolonize, whereby you, the attempt was actually to Africanize, and to Africanize means to populate the university with the black faces and therefore you conclude that we have now decolonized but the same people whom you put there physically they are in africa but epistemologically they are in new york they 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 they, 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 they that there's that problem so those those will be my set of of remarks but the second one is also related to knowledge what do we do with the dominant knowledge which has been produced over the past 500 years? Uh, I think uh, we have also reflected on that uh, already in the sense that the issue is not to remove and replace. And we always argue that if you go for remove and replace, then we have repeated exactly the same problem which you are trying to run away from. Because what 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 Eurocentric knowledge did was to remove and replace. And when you are doing decolonization, you don't need to use the same the same principle of then you remove and replace. You 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 move from one fundamentalism to another, unaware, thinking you are actually uh, 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 changing things. So what exactly should we do? I think what we should do is the uh, is to adopt a critical approach to dominant knowledge. A more critical approach than before of dominant knowledge. When I went to school, of course there was a critical approach, but generally we tended to absorb knowledge. Uh, I came from uh, from South Africa where there is roads must fall and fees must fall. It will be difficult to just go into a class these days and they teach about uh, Hegel and the students just leave you like that. They will always ask, why are you teaching that? So you need to really explain why problematic as he is, you still need to know about him or you are actually paying him in order to reveal something. About so that's, 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 that's why I emphasize the issue that when I'm speaking about this issue of uh, decolonizing knowledge, I'm not speaking about remove and replace. I'm actually speaking about uh, um, ecologies of knowledges. Some they speak about it in terms of uh, who is this? Uh, Ryan Cornell he speaks about it in terms of uh, mosaic epistemology. The the world is poorer if it relies on one or two epistemologies. The world is richer if we bring more. And the crisis which we are facing today demands the urgency that we bring more knowledges which have been pushed out. Perhaps it can help us out of the present crisis. Uh, the issue of, uh, of IOP, I think it was crafted in the same idea of the of the north <laughs> of the north the north as a geography 
but it can be located uh, where it is located but as long as the people who are who, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are who are who are who are there their consciousness is different it can actually help a lot in the advancement of decolonization so i think it takes us back to following up on uh, and the discussed these comments one of the major issues which we i think is very important for us to 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 think about how do we change the consciousness of the current intellectuals because an intellectual like me and you having come from a particular uh, produced by a particular system of education it means we need to work very hard on ourselves you remember that book which says the miseducation of a negro if there is indeed miseducation it means we need to invest a lot in re-education and who is to be educated is not the student the professors themselves you remember the marxist equation who will educate the educator and i think it's important that we become very modest and very honest in this in this struggle which were involved and they, we we put it in such a way we might actually be the problem because of the way we have been produced and they were working on ourselves so that we see things different <clears throat> Oh, then the final, the final, the final issue which I wanted. You remember when I ended? I ended with the the, the ten Ds of the decolonial ten. One of the Ds was de-imperialize. To de-imperialize is actually an agenda of the global north. It's 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 really an agenda. If you if you if you check the work of Kuan Hissing Chen, he spoke about the two agendas of decolonize and de-imperialize. That but. The major problem it takes us to that to that joke by uh, Slavoj Jacob saying this person who was crazy who who always ran away from the chickens thinking the chickens were going to eat him he was gone when he was reoriented and uh, he realized that he was a human being he could not be eaten by corn but when he went out after five minutes he came back running back to the psychiatric ward and when they asked what is the problem again he repeated the chicken. And they said, but we thought you now know that way a human being says, but does the chicken know? So you can't change one part and leave the other part, because the other part will still behave the same. So it, it needs really to deal with the psyche of the those in quotation mark called Northern scholars and those in the global south, if we are to move into another relationship, as 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 the, the discussant was speaking about partnerships. <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Johan, do you have any uh, comments on that? Well, maybe the first comment would be that I, I, uh, I fully agree with many of the things that, uh, that uh, Professor Nlovu Kacheni is saying, that indeed we need, I mean, uh, I like it very much, uh, this necessity to unlearn. Uh, I, uh, I did not tell that I was mistrained as an economist, um, because because I know some of my economists colleagues uh, do not really like that when I say that, uh, but but for me it is it is definitely true. Uh, I already said that I found the initial framework in which I was trained to be uh, unsatisfactory to to try to really honestly understand what was happening. Uh, that's also why at the level of the IOB, for example. I, I, I could now uh, inform you and tell you about the, uh, the mixed methods and mixed perspectives uh, that we have. But that is something indeed which we had to work on very hard. Eh? Uh, mm. We started with research methods courses which, which only had quantitative methods, then gradually qualitative methods were added. And then later on now we have uh, more political and epistemological research methods. One course reflecting about what research and producing knowledge is about. Uh, so this is just a reflection, I think, of, of indeed our efforts, which are not enough yet. Still, I don't think that all of our uh, all of our scholars at the IOB are fully 
uh, fully up to date on that. I think I, I'm still dreaming of, a, of, a, of an institute uh, doctoral course, which we don't have, which actually would very, very much require this, I think. So it's ongoing work, but indeed I fully agree uh, that we need to do so. And I'm a little bit proud that at least uh, it's not now that decolonization is becoming a bit of a fashion uh, that, um, that we as IOB have not been waiting in the previous decades to work on that. Um, so, so and, and as I told you, just like you said, I, I, I fully agree, and it still costs us uh, in the West, I think, to really understand that indeed we need we need much more knowledges than uh, than the knowledge that we think represents is represented by our science. Mm. And by the way, if you start to think a little bit deeper, the concept of our science doesn't make sense either. Huh? Mm. Uh, we can see that very much in the current crisis. All our scientific experts are rolling over the floor, fighting with each other about what to do and not to do uh, in the current crisis. And so I think also science in itself evidently always is limited. And that's, that's the only possible starting point to enter into any policy debate, I think, or in any uh, more fundamental debate. Um, now, with respect to the questions, uh, I think the questions, maybe to provoke the students who ask them a little bit, the questions in itself are interesting. Uh, in the sense, for example, uh, if uh, uh, in the first question about whether, uh, if we assume that people in the South can think for themselves, whether that invalidates any scholar from the North thinking about the development <laughs> of the South, um i mean it's it's interesting because it 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 parts from a view as if those realities north and south actually exist mm -hmm. uh, as if our uh, as if our development is not connected mm -hmm. uh, i mean you you, you talked about planetary human entanglement of course mm -hmm. indeed the global south is in the global north and sustains the global north and the global north is in the global south and and partially helps it and partially makes uh, all its problems more difficult. And I think, for example, that we simply cannot leave the development of the North to the scholars of the North alone. Uh, uh, so just like I, I, I put it a bit in a provocative way, because implicitly in that question, it is if the question is only relevant for the, for the, the so-called Global South. But why wouldn't that be relevant for the global north then also. If we are so entangled, I mean, yes, I, I really think that we cannot leave the development of the global south to the global south alone, just like we cannot leave the development of the global north to the global north uh, on its own either. So, so I think there, that's part of the mindset that, that I think uh, we, need, we need to change. Uh, and I think indeed, I argued, and I strongly believe in cooperation with certain scholars, but I, I deliberately, one of the interesting things in our cooperation with the people in Central America in the latest uh, time is that they actually always come back to the fact, why are we just collaborating about development in Central America? Shouldn't we talk also about development in your country? Huh? Of course, in particular, also about uh, uh, issues and topics that relate to uh, to the environment, for example, but also, for example, to uh, financial policies. I, I, we, we are involved in a, in a microfinance initiative there. They are confronted with sometimes really weird strategies of their funders and their investors. And so I think we need to get in also in that sense to get rid a bit of this uh, dichotomy be between the North and the South. And the other question, about the powerful people which never educated the less powerful people, and that would imply that IOB should actually become redundant. The implicit assumption seems to be that IOB is powerful or that the IOB is serving the powerful. That's not a self-conception that I have. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that uh, we, are, we, we are not, I mean, we, we, are, not, we are not at all such a powerful Institute, and we certainly do not 
aim to only represent the views of the powerful. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, in fact, maybe I can speak from my own experience in the current uh, in the current times, very difficult times in Nicaragua, uh, with a deep political crisis and a frustrated uh, socialist revolution. It's actually very hard for me and very frustrating to see that we are doing, together with the people over there, efforts for three de decades to try to support peasants and to try to think about an alternative or peasant-based development in Nicaragua. And we need to acknowledge that we have not at all been very successful uh, in changing the dominant entrepreneurial extractive model that still prevails and that we still are fighting against. Uh, so it's, it's a bit... Uh, uh, it's a bit um, a strange idea, I think, to assume that we are powerful and that we are on the side of the powerful. And it would actually imply also that true international solidarity uh, would not be possible. And I think it's not a it's it's a very tricky, difficult thing, but I think it's uh, it's certainly uh, possible and uh, and necessary. And I think with respect to the invalidation of previous knowledge produced by scholars of the global north. Well, I think uh, we should not think in all too massive terms. Eh? Uh, I, if I look at my own uh, production of knowledge, let's say 15 years ago, I would have a look at it right now. I'm quite sure that there will be parts where I, where I would say, oh, that was a nice idea. That seems to be true uh, still, but I'm sure that other things would would be things where I no lo which I do no, no longer support or might even be ashamed of. So I think uh, we should avoid uh, two massive uh, binaries over there also. Okay, uh, thank you so much for those uh, submissions. And uh, maybe the next set of questions uh, will will also be in line with some of the, the responses you've given, especially when you talked about uh, mixed methods and the methodologies that we use in development studies and how these are geared to open up the frontiers for uh, uh, various perspectives. One interesting question comes in, uh, and it's also in relation to the, the, the article, uh, some statements in the articles that were they read, where they, the, the, the snippet is that uh, the author argues that adoption of a decolonial epistemic perspective in development studies would aid in unmasking the hidden power structures which are found colonial relations of exploitation and domination and sustain the underdevelopment of the global south. And in the article, it is further argued that development studies currently are affected by weak thought, as opposed to strong thought, which would have enabled us to move beyond concentration on techniques and methodological innovations to challenging knowledge and producing grand and innovative theories that would re revolutionize development as we see it today. So in in a sense, the, the, the student is asking, uh, are these techniques, these uh, mixed methods, these other approaches, the small changes we are making, uh, which, according to the article, they are classified as uh, a product of weak thought, and uh, will this move us towards the, 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 the paradigm of strong thought where we innovate theories, uh, grand theories? And then the second question, uh, states that uh, it has been discussed that the current development studies um, perpetuate perspectives of uh, Western perspectives of development, a developed country. As a result, terms such as democracy, reforms, good governance, and humanitarian intervention have been continually broadcast with little to no critique on the, on the colonial matrices underlying them. Liberal and uh, capitalistic values have thus been sustained, painting the global south as underdeveloped and in need of aid. This indeed ensures that the dynamics of power introduced by the colonialists continue to exist. However, does a decolonial perspective require a blame game? It require that a blame game is instituted where the underdeveloped in the south is, is the underdevelopment in the south is blamed on the north, or, or should we move beyond? The, the blame and, and, and guilt, the blame and shame came. And then the third, the third question uh, is, uh, 
um, I'm sieving them out is to talk about um, uh, the, the issue of the locus of enunciation, right? In, in one of the articles, you talk about the locus of enunciation, where you say uh, a decolonial epistemic perspective does not attempt to claim universality, neutrality, and singular truthfulness. With a decolonial epistemic perspective, there is open acceptance of partiality of knowledge. Further, the centrality of the locus of enunciation is highlighted as providing the foundation upon which knowledge claims are made. So advocacy for attention to locus of enunciation could therefore be synonymous with uh, advocacy for scientific relativism as opposed to objectivity or realism. Hence, uh, don't decolonial epistemic perspectives fuel identity politics? And uh, the, to clarify the question, they quote Tore Wig, an associate professor in uh, the, the Department of Political Science at the University of Oslo, where he states that this uh, in, in one of his blog articles, it says that this, I think, locus of enunciation will lead to research becoming fragmented along the lines of identity politics, where principles such as objectivity, neutrality, and rationality are viewed as Western constructs, while arguments advanced by researchers from the global south will be evaluated only in the light of identity politics. And this involves pulling a, an epistemological straitjacket over the heads of female and non-Western researchers, stating that this is your female perspective and this is your Global South perspective. Uh, what do you have to say about those? Professor, you can unmute yourself. Very interesting questions and uh, very common. Uh, common critiques. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, I start with a, a very a very general uh, statement, uh, which perhaps relates also to the previous questions. You see, one of the, the major problems in the knowledge domain is how do we know in a non-colonial way. How do we recognize that we have diverse knowers? And how do we make sure that in our production of knowledge, we don't end up falling into the trap of a civilizational agenda? The colonial civilizational agenda that even those who are based in the global south those who are congregated within a university they then look at the university it becomes just an oasis sort of of civilization in a sea of barbarity whereby when you go into into the communities you really go to educate them rather than to learn from them. So that's that's a that's a deeper question in the attempt to colonize knowledge that we need to really think carefully about that. Then the second set of a general uh, a statement: the decolonial perspective are that all human beings, if they are human beings, are born in valid and the legitimate knowledge systems. Um, and then coming to the questions themselves, um, I think this idea that there is truthful universal knowledge, it remains an aspiration, is not a reality. we are very suspicious of people who wants to hide their local their locus of enunciation so as to claim objectivity it doesn't mean that when you acknowledge your locus of enunciation therefore you are going to degenerate into scientific relativism it just means that you reveal yourself 
and the discussed mention the work of uh, Paul Freire. And the Paul Freire actually says is openly that if you are a teacher, you must reveal yourself first. I'm a man, I am male, I am this, I am that. All your multiple identities, they influence the your epistemology and the way you produce knowledge. So to, to argue about objectivity and the subjectivity, I think that that is a question which uh, from a decolonial perspective were very clear that uh, the aspiration is really for people to produce knowledge in a very genuine uh, way and that genuine way is to reveal yourself that but i might have bias here i might have bias there there is no person without any biases in the production of knowledge because of the subjectivities uh, and that actually takes us to the question of uh, when you critique coloniality as a global power structure which disempowers other people and empowers others, I think that is not a blame game. It's really to point to a problem which has plunged this world into so many of the conflicts so many of the inequalities and we need to to face that then the first question about the issue of methodology i think the the work of uh, linda twice smith on decolonizing methodology becomes very instructive in that area uh, we continuously try to improve our methodological entry points and the issue of mixing the methods is one part, but I think there are also other decolonial imperatives which needs to be taken into account. Who researches who? Where do you research? How do you choose where you are going to research? And uh, how do you treat the people as objects or as subjects? Is it a co-production of knowledge? So there are, there are a lot of various issues which, which relates to methodology itself. Uh, and the, whose methodology is this, which 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 we are all using, and how did it come about? All those are important questions as we try to reconstitute knowledge at this conjuncture. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Johan. Yeah, maybe I can I can just uh, start with the final point, which which actually uh, allows me to. To clarify that when when we at IOB talk about mixed methods, we are not talking about just mixing qualitative and quantitative methods. Although some people, maybe even in the IOB, continue to understand it like this, but it's actually a broader concept where you say, okay, any research, no matter what type of research, is always uh, framed in a particular way. It adopts particular epistemological perspectives, uh, so it takes particular stances. It has to do with, with all the things uh, that uh, Professor Novo Gacheni just uh, has said. Uh, who researches who? How do you approach this? For what? Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, of issues there, and we just recognize at our institute, and we think it is absolutely necessary indeed, uh, and that's then I. Uh, this uh, logic of uh, this locus of enunciation, of course, we recognize that we all try to do research uh, and scientific research from our own particular positioning vis-a-vis -vis all these things. Uh, we, we have particular philosophical ideas, we have particular values, we have particular mental models which structures the way we look at reality, how we see problems, what kind of solutions we consider, who we think uh, can contribute to, to those solutions in what way. So whatever scientific methods you are talking about, I think inevitably there is always uh, a part of the research problem and the research process which is not scientific in itself. And uh, there, there's always non-scientific, that's why I talked about that, non-scientific starting points, and non-scientific elements in which the scientific analysis takes place. 
So I, I uh, uh, so I do not think when I say that we are we are adopting mixed methods that we that we fall into the trap of the weak thoughts, uh, or not necessarily. I think uh, uh, the mixed methods perspective actually means that we uh, we adopt and we are at least in theory open to all kinds of theories. Uh, I'm not so sure, however, uh, I mean, I, I do believe we need indeed strong theories, but we must, I mean, it's a bit problematic for me to say in the 1950s, we had grand theories, indeed we had, but they were very problematic to my point of view. So I already revealed my own positioning. I feel, I feel safer um with actor oriented approaches at a more micro and local level which does not mean that we do not have to develop and are not developing theories uh in that perspective also um but uh i i, I think uh, an idea that we need a, a new grand theory would make me a little bit skeptical but indeed uh, i also share i fully share the idea that uh, uh, and 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 science, scientists should not be afraid. It's not because you accept a uh, mixed methods perspective and you recognize that uh, all scientific knowledge is situated and positioned in a particular way that you necessarily become redundant as a scientific researcher. It's just a way that, and uh, it, it just means that the knowledge you create uh, it might be objective or it might be rigorous according to your disciplinary perspectives within the frame that you have uh, adopted and accepted, which, not, which is not all um, uh, scientifically grounded. So I think uh, even the positivists, which do no longer exist, know that a positivistic uh, project to try to ground any knowledge in empirical facts was a failure. So any serious post-positivist uh, scientific uh, uh, science philosopher today would accept that. It doesn't, of course, mean that uh, we end up in, uh, in a complete relativism uh, at all. Um, I, uh, I, f I mean, because even within such a perspective, not anything goes. An, an apple will not fall from the ground up to the tree highly improbable so there, it, it, there is still some some uh, degree of uh, of uh, facts and truth to a number of, of things which can be uh, uh, established by science but a leap taking a leap from uh, from that um, that uh, uh, idea to, to to positing the the uh, the false idea of an objective science for everything is is uh, really false. And I have another idea that the scene you need to go to other questions, so I will stop. Yes, uh, um, we are going to go to the uh, the audience's questions, and uh, I would request that uh, uh, for each question we give uh, uh, a concise uh, response that we can be able to co cover a number of them in the limited time that we are left with. Um, so I don't know if the questions are already presented, yeah? So the first question, as you can see it on the list, is can an Institute of Development Studies ever be decolonial? Is recognizing different perspectives enough to be decolonial? Just briefly and uh, concisely, this question, then we move to the next. Uh, if we start with uh, uh, Professor Sabello. You could unmute yourself. That one is a difficult question because uh, to decolonize an institute is actually a process rather than an event, and we can't a priori foreclose its possibility of change. Uh, things always change. So if decolonization is about change, it means it's possible for an institute to change as long as the people invest the energy in doing that. Okay, then uh, maybe if we can hear from Johan. 
Well, I, I just would like to repeat the idea that I uh, explained in my introduction. I think uh, at, and that's not about the Institute, but about, about the planet and the world today. I, I think we cannot afford decolonize in a terribly violent way at the, at the juncture where we are now. And therefore, I think that decolonization is a necessary precondition to try to avoid uh, an all too violent uh, solution to this problem. Okay, thank you so much. The next uh, question is, what kind of strategies exist and does an institution, an institute as the IOB use to decenter what is often called the white gaze in development studies? Uh, Professor Sabello? And that one looks like is a very specific one to the IOP. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you can hear from Johan first, then, as you can recollect. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, I think as I, I, I already said, uh, that it, it is not an easy challenge for an institute like the IOP. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, it's not a black and white in this context. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a really tricky way to, to formulate it, maybe. But I think I think it's indeed a process. And I think uh, uh, I, I would certainly challenge the idea that at IOB, we have a clear white gaze only. That's, that's not uh, true, I think. Uh, and I think one of the reasons, but not the sole reason, is, of course, that we, we have this tradition of uh, of uh, uh, long-term cooperation with academic scholars of the South. And I think we also have a, a tradition and I hope a practice of non-bankable education in our institute, where we treat our students not as the ones who need to receive our knowledge, but actually as co-creators and co-thinkers uh, of all these theories of development which we present to them and which I already said are contradictory in themselves, which is what is exactly what I like, because it forces students not to sit passively and just absorb. All right, thank you. Uh, is there anything you want to add, Professor Sabella, or we move to the next question? When we talk, only that we need to say that when we talk about white case, we're talking about something which is resident in the discourse itself. And uh, even if it is development studies in the global south, it can have a white case still inside. So that's why it's really an issue of epistemology rather than really of institutions per se. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question is, capital and colonial logics depend upon plurality and diversity. How can plural epistemological knowledge avoid becoming new extractive frontiers for, for, for produce to produce a more inclusive status quo? Do we need more knowledges or should we rather deprioritize hegemonic knowledge? It's a double process if I, if I, if I, if I, if I can be very precise. It's a double process. You de-hegemonize, but at the same time, de-hegemonize in order to open up for other knowledges to come into the space. Okay. Uh, you, want, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah maybe. Um, I mean, I, 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 uh, I indeed think we need to fully understand, uh, because there's a, there's a reference here to capital and colonial uh, logics. I think uh, this key idea of the cognitive empire and the colonial project, colonial imperial process, is of course this fatal coupling of race, gender, class, and place mm. Uh, mm. in the production of the unequal, unjust world that we have today. And that's not something that only takes place in the so-called global south. We have that and increasingly have that in our own diversified uh, and 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 gradually more stratified society. So in that sense also, I think uh, we have this, this joint uh, struggle ahead of us of, of, of decolonizing, but also the extra, I mean, the protecting ourselves, protecting nature from the same logic. That's why I talked about 
uh, the, the crisis of civilization today, it is clear that the extract extractivist model is, is dangerous for our survival uh, and for our life-sustaining ecosystems, but it is probably also dangerous for our own humanity. We, the, the modern subjectivity produced by today's uh, technologies and economy uh, frames us as, a, as an always working, never uh, never free to, never people without time, uh, without a life of their own. We all know that, but we continue to to uh, to run ahead. And I think it's one of the interesting things we see during the current COVID crisis because it forces us all to stop. But and and while we were stopping, there were many many voices saying, "Oh, look how nice we we can breathe again." Uh, the air is clean, we have more time, we have a family, we, we can think, uh, we detoxic, uh, I mean, we we, uh, we become less toxic in our work, alcoholism. Uh, but, of course, the, the logic of disciplination uh, of these logics is not something that just happens to the poor black people or the poor brown people in the global south. It happens to us academics and Western people as well. So we all need to escape and to be able to liberate ourselves from these from these logics. I think. All right. I think uh, in the in just one minute, the last the last question: uh, How will the decolonial decolonizing of academia contribute to the decolonization of society's development vision in general? Uh, what's your tangible actions and outreach plans? Need I add? For example, for the IOB, how would uh, making a decolonial perspective at the IOB influence, in general, the University of Antwerp? Uh, you you want ahead. me to go first? Yes. I think uh, I think the what what is brought in there is uh, an interesting. Uh, a challenge which uh, Fanon put very well about if the psychotic unit itself is a sick, how do you cure the sick who come to the psychotic unit? So the issue why we start with the decolonization of the university is because we want to detox that space first before we take ourselves into the society because we can actually carry toxins into society. So I think the issue is, where do you start? And I say it at the beginning, it starts with me as a product of a westernized university, dealing with my own uh, colonialities, which I embedded in me before I move on to deal, to, in order to have a new relationship with society, a new relationship with knowledge, so that I don't approach society as as though it needs civilization, society actually imports knowledge. So it, it changes the whole ball game, even in terms of methodology. How do you go there? Do you go there and say these are objects of research or they are subjects of research, then co-production of knowledge? So it's a it's a it's a broader project which 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 needs to 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 uh, to be actioned at many levels. And the the problem is is not always the academic who needs to detox and then at the same time he goes to society to detox. Perhaps the society is already more detoxed than the academic. That's why we focus on the academic. Okay, thank you so much, Johan, in just a few minutes. One minute. Yeah, well, I, th I, I think uh, uh, one of my old professors said the university is the place where society thinks itself. I, I'm not 100% convinced that that's a truly uh write this uh, way uh, to depict it but i think nevertheless that through our students maybe also through the research we do and the outreach that we have we we definitely have an influence whether that influence is all that that crucial and critical i don't know i think the process such is so complex uh, that at least i don't pretend to have a grand theory of how we are going to decolonialize i think everybody should do that their particular time and place where they work, and at least in the academy, in the academia, I mean, we need 
first of all, to be critical and self-critical of ourselves, very much in the way that uh, um, Professor Lovu Gacheni just said. Uh, but also, I think we need to form and train our students. That's, that's, that's critical that our students, who we say are becoming or are intended to become change makers, that they learn to think critically. They don't need to learn my theories. They don't need to share my ideas. They need to know that there is a real debate taking place and that they need to make their contribution to the creation of a better future, a better future which is more just and which might be viable in the near term. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, the contributions and for answering those very interesting and uh, tough questions. Uh, um, thank you to the participants, to the students and the general audience that have participated in this debate. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think we shall have, uh, 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 next week we shall also be having another debate. So just to remind all those who have participated today that you can join us again next week on 3rd November. Uh, the debate is titled uh, Feminist Ecologies and Coloniality of the Body. And for that debate, the keynote is Dr. Brigitte Baptiste, which is an advocate of gender diversity and environmental conservation. And she's the head of EAN University in Colombia. And the discussant will be Ms. Iris Verskave. She is the co chair of FURIA, which is a Belgian. Uh, Flemish feminist think tank. Uh, I should uh, inform you that the final registrations are entering in rapidly, so please register for this debate and do not miss it. Uh, thank you again, all. Thank and, you also. Uh, and yeah, see you then next week. Perhaps. Uh, Uh, Janus, you can stop the recording maybe?